So, dear colleagues, friends, I think this might be a good time to start. Uh, good afternoon and a very wel warm welcome to the office of the Baha'i International Community. And my name is Ming, uh, and we're very pleased that you have joined us for this informal educational session and discussion to explore the nexus between development and human rights, specifically within the broader context of the post-2015 development agenda discussions. We are grateful for the support of the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights, and we are honoured to have its two distinguished experts, Mr. Craig Mokaiba and Mr. Nuhom Sangare, for making the time to join us. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I believe over these couple of days, there have already been uh, two formal events mm -hmm. organised by OHCHR related to our session. However, this more informal exploration session will no doubt be much appreciated by the NGO colleagues here. So, let me now invite the first speaker, Mr. Craig Mokaiba, who is the Chief of the Development and Social and Economic Issues Branch. Mr. Mokaiba, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Thanks for the invitation. Thanks for saying it's informal so I can do this because I'm cooking. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Basically jogged here just now from uh, the other side of the UN building. So. Uh, a bit warm. Thank you very much. Thanks for all of you who, who come to have this uh, conversation. We'll keep it as informal as we possibly can. It's good timing because uh, you know that uh, we're here right now to, to engage in the post-2015 dialogue that's going on on many fronts uh, here in New York, but also uh, in countries around the world where consultations have been underway for the better part of a year to see how this new development um, framework should be uh, developed. And, you know, for us, it's such an unmissable opportunity, pre precisely because of the theme of this talk today, which is, um, you know, the relationship between human rights and development. But for us, it's very much about the, you know, a battle for the soul of development, because mm -hmm. there are a lot of approaches to so-called development. Uh, you will be familiar with this. Uh, and from a human rights perspective, you know, the thing that we begin with is a recognition that so-called development can act either do good or it can do harm. And the harm that development done wrong can do to people's human rights, to people's lives, to people's dignity, is significant. So we have uh, not just an interest, but an obligation in making sure that the way people look at development and the way people do development is uh, consistent with international human rights norms and standards. Now, to anybody who's involved in uh, social justice work, human rights work, even development work broadly defined, it sounds all self-evident and obvious. But it hasn't been. Even within the United Nations, which has you know, uh, the three principal purposes of human rights, economic and social development, and peace and security, those three pillars of the organization have really been pursued more as silos. And there have been real interests and real efforts that have been built up over 65 years to keep those things as separate as possible, mm. to make sure that um, the political understanding of development is not corrupted mm -hmm. by human rights obligations, mm -hmm. if I can put it in those terms. So what we've been doing, and so many civil society groups have been trying to do um, over the course of the, the last 20 years especially, is to chip away at those silos mm -hmm. and to try to unpack the notion of development, the notion of poverty, the notion of international cooperation in ways that are much more respectful of people's civil, political, economic, social, and cultural rights and their right. Uh, and, and their right to development. Just to give you an example of how, uh, how this thing can play out in the real world, uh, the High Commissioner is very fond of using the example of Tunisia. So, uh, you know, Tunisia, if you went to the website of the World Bank, the IMF, the major development agencies, even after the revolution in Tunisia broke out, what you would have read on that website was that, and I'm going to give you some quotes, Tunisia has made remarkable progress and equitable growth, fighting poverty, achieving good social indicators. It was on track to achieve the MDGs, hooray. It was far ahead in terms of governance effectiveness, rule of law, control of corruption, regulatory quality. It was, quote, one of the most equitable societies. Mm. It was, quote, a top reformer. It was, quote, the development model that Tunisia has pursued over the past two decades has served the country well. Mm. You know, when we read that stuff coming from the human rights side of the house, we were astounded. And the thing that struck us the most, because we were getting a very different message. I'll give you some quotes from what was coming into the human rights side of the UN. Uh, we heard about excluded and marginalized communities, imposed indignities, 
the denial of economic and social rights, inequalities, discrimination, absence of participation, absence of decent jobs, absence of labor rights, political repression, abs absence of fundamental freedoms, free assembly, association, free speech, censorship, arbitrary detention, and the lack of an independent judiciary. You know, so on the one hand, what we knew was that the Tunisian model was a model of fear and want. And yet, those who were very much engaged around the MDG agenda were reporting, and didn't even update their websites after all of it fell apart, were reporting that it effectively was a paradise because they had met the MDGs. You know, so, so what's wrong? What was wrong was the very concept of development is contained in the MDGs and those things that went along with it. So basically, a narrow set of socioeconomic indicators not linked to human rights in the way they were defined. And, you know, at the same time, uh, an overly narrow and obsessive focus on economic growth. Hmm. So growth narrowly <coughs> defined with all of its negative characteristics as well as positive, no attention to inequalities, no attention to that whole half of the development matrix that looks at things like administration of justice, mm -hmm. personal security, democratic participation, uh, and even in those socioeconomic categories, no look at health and education uh, and water and sanitation as human rights, merely as goals that allow a certain amount of violation to take place uh, in any event. So mm -hmm. it's not what we would call development from a, from a human rights perspective. And, and the thing that we thought was most striking about this was it wasn't that they got it wrong. What they were measuring, they measured correctly. It's just that they were measuring the wrong things or not measuring enough of the right things in defining the development situation in the country. That's what I mean by there's a battle for the soul of development going on in the post-2015 discussions now and an effort to try to change the analytical lens to make it not just not so narrow, but also in some cases to turn it in another direction, to have it focused on the way that we've been saying development should be defined. Development should be defined as freedom from fear and freedom from want for all without discrimination, to, to put it in a, a simple bumper sticker phrase. That's the way we've been talking about it. And that's clearly not what we were seeing uh, being guaranteed by previous development um, uh, approaches. So. You know, in the first, you've got this conceptual challenge. You know, what is development? Is development growth or is, is development GDP? If it's GDP, we're really in trouble. Uh, because GDP, this measure of, uh, of growth, gro gross domestic product, takes you know, the, the, the value, let's say the market value of all uh, products and services that are bought and sold uh, uh, on the market. It's the most widely used indicator still uh, of, of economic growth. Uh, and the problem is that it doesn't make any distinction at all between the activities that are harmful and the ones that are beneficial. It's all mm -hmm. added up as a part of, uh, of GDP. And so the, even the goalpost that you're working toward may be making, making people's lives worse rather than better. And it doesn't pay attention to the inequalities that undercut sustainable development north and south, uh, and increasingly, increasingly so. It includes things like you know, what you spend on jailing prisoners, uh, um, building weapons, uh, uh, you know, environmental yes. degradation, uh, cost of national disasters, That's all, those are all counted as positives yes. in, in, in GDP, not a human rights based uh, approach to development by, by any means. Um, so, so, you know, what we're saying is you really need to get away from that measure of development and base your development measures on something which is uh, much more aligned with the international human rights uh, framework. So uh, Stiglitz, you know, Joseph Stiglitz, the Nobel laureate who speaks often at the UN, uh, economist, I mean, he, he put it this way, he said, um, effectively he said, what we measure affects what we do. If we use the wrong measures, we will strive for the wrong things. Mm -hmm. And I think that is, a, is the best way to describe the way our economic policy and our development policy has been framed uh, for the last 50 years. We have strived for the wrong things, and Tunisia is just the most recent uh, example of that. The human rights-based approach would look at things differently, and we'll talk about what, uh, what that is. By the way, there have been in recent years a whole series of alternative ways to measure <coughs> growth that are completely different from GDP, some of them very promising. The Kingdom of Bhutan has a gross national happiness index. Canada has launched an index of well-being. The UK has added a happiness index to its national, uh, to national well-being. This, the Sen Stiglitz uh, Fitoussi Commission that uh, the President of France established has looked at measuring economic performance and social progress 
to identify uh, uh, growth. There's the green national accounting that adjusts for environmental uh, costs, uh, uh, all of these elements. The Happy Planet Index, one of the more interesting ones. Um, and, and even uh, within the UN, now a number of initiatives looking at alternative measures of, uh, of growth, and we hope those will find ways to integrate human rights. So, so if you don't start with this narrow focus on badly defined growth, and you don't start just looking at a narrow set of socioeconomic indicators, which is what the MDGs uh, mm -hmm. are. Uh, there's a lot of good that's come out of the MDGs, but now we're at a moment where we need to see critically what we can do to make it uh, to make it better. And one of the you know the unfortunate byproducts of the MDGs is that they could actually have a negative uh, impact on uh, on particular human rights, as we heard in a, a, a panel this week as well. Um, and, and and so you know the the time for change it seems to me absolutely urgent. None of the MDGs um, uh, were rights based. Uh, they had low quantitative thresholds. Uh, there are no provisions for equality or, or disaggregation, no participatory processes, no legal accountability uh, of the kind that human rights provides, no guarantees of a minimum social floor. So you could have declare success stories with <coughs> enormous amounts of your population af actually living uh, in a complete absence of, of human dignity, no minimum core obligations, uh, none of the kinds of things that you talk about in, uh, mm -hmm. in human rights terms. And it's interesting because in 1986 we had a declaration on the right to development adopted by the General Assembly. Mm -hmm. The 20 years ago next month uh, was actually endorsed by consensus, all member states endorsed by consensus the declaration on the right to development, including its, de its definition of development that talked about a comprehensive economic, social, cultural, and political process for the constant improvement of well-being for the entire population and all individuals based upon free, active, and meaningful participation and a fair distribution of the resulting benefits. And that's quite a different way to look at development when you compare it to you know, narrow notions of, of GDP. We had a similar conceptual challenge from a human rights perspective with the notion of poverty. Mm -hmm. You know, what is poverty? Is poverty an absence of income? Is it a dollar a day, as the World Bank used to, to measure it? The interesting thing that happened with poverty is that you know, the World Bank itself spent $20 million in 10 years on a study called The Voices of the Poor, where they actually went out and asked the poor about the phenomenon of poverty. What does it mean to be poor? What does it mean to live uh, in, in, in poverty? And what they heard was very different from the dollar a day analysis. What they heard is really it's about discrimination, marginalization, exclusion. It's about abuse at the hands of local authorities. It's about violations of civil and political rights as well as denial of economic and, uh, and social rights, uh, absence of security, power, choices, mm -hmm. and human rights. Mm -hmm. um, and so, what, you know, why is that important? The way you define a problem will determine the solutions you devise yeah. to address it. So if the problem is an absence of income, or it's only a dollar a day, you find ways to supplement income and poverty goes away. Surprise, surprise, poverty doesn't go away because you haven't addressed the issues of power and security mm -hmm. and discrimination and exclusion uh, in the ways that you need to to have sustainable progress in the battle against uh, poverty, poverty itself, a complex human rights violation from, from our, our perspective. So, so on the other side of the aisle, what you have is the human rights program of the UN that defined poverty as, and I'm quoting, um, the, a human condition characterized by the sustained or chronic deprivation of resources, capabilities, choices, security, and power necessary for the enjoyment of an adequate standard of living and other civil, political, economic, social, and cultural rights. Quite different from a dollar a day when you get down to it. It's a complex phenomenon. It needs a complex solution that responds to, it, uh, mm -hmm. to its realities. So, so th you know, that's the conceptual challenge, is moving away from things that are defined uh, from a certain political perspective, if I may say so, and into one that actually suits what are the basic needs and rights of, uh, of, of human beings. Um, now, it hasn't, we, we, you know, not, <coughs> and this is what I have to say in terms of a mea culpa for the international human rights movement, you know, we have not always helped the problem. We have the right to development, which is a quite a clearly articulated right in its declaration, but the debates, the politicized debates around the right to development have thickened the clouds and mm -hmm. the fog so much that it's ended up being counterproductive to mm -hmm. the development of meaningful development policy. It should not be the case, right? Uh, and there are so many myths about the right to, uh, the right to development, uh, that, that it's a state right, that it's some kind of a, uh, a Trojan horse for resource transfers from north uh, uh, to south, that it's a, that it's a, 
it's a political objective, but not really a right, that it's a super right that trumps all other rights uh, uh, and is more important than all other rights, uh, uh, or an umbrella right, as some people call it. None of this is true. There is no sort of legislative authority to interpret the right to development in those ways. The right to development, like any other right, has a specific content. It has identified rights holders, people, and identified duty bearers, states, principally, uh, when it comes to the right to development. And the fact that it's a, a complex right that sets out a process, that you have to have development which includes uh, meaningful participation, that includes non-discrimination, that respects self-determination, that doesn't make it different from other rights. It makes it very much like other rights. The right to a fair trial is not a right to win your case. It's a right to a certain process. The right to free and fair elections is not a right to be elected. It's a right to a fair process with certain mm -hmm. uh, hallmarks as they, as they are defined. Um, so blowing away some of the fog around those things, you know, also a part of the, uh, of the conceptual uh, challenge for, for, for the right to development. Well, we, we talk about another issue in all of this, which is how to do development in a way that respects human rights. Mm -hmm. And here we emphasize always um, five principles in trying to chip away at those silos. One is free, active, and meaningful participation. This is a right under international human rights law in matters of the public interest. It's not uh, just good development policy, it's a right. Um, we talk about accountability, but a particular kind of accountability. Accountability of uh, duty bearers, you know, principally government, uh, but other actors, uh, to rights holders, you know, people, individuals, and communities, um, which changes things quite remarkably. Mm -hmm. Talk about non-discrimination and attention to vulnerable groups. You know, if you looked at South Africa in aggregate, um, and, you know, after the, you know, from the period from the end of apartheid until now, what you see is a pretty good, reasonably wealthy, well-to-do state. The minute you disaggregate by race, mm. what you find is a rich white country and a poor mm. non-white uh, country. That's not development from a point of view of a human rights-based approach. So, so that means breaking it down, disaggregating, finding out who is excluded, who is marginalized, who's benefiting here and now in, in a particular uh, country. We talk about empowerment uh, as being a key element here. And this means economic empowerment, lots of schemes on ways to do that, mm -hmm. political empowerment vis-a-vis -vis the government, vis-a-vis -vis large corporations, vis-a-vis -vis whoever it is that wielding, you know, warlords, whoever is wielding the power uh, at that moment. And then that last element, fifth element, explicitly linking your development plans and policies and programs to the international human rights framework, to those treaties and those treaty bodies, those mechanisms and those standards that are binding on all member states uh, of, of the United Nations, and that equally bind the donor and the beneficiary and also create responsibilities for international <coughs> institutions. So everybody's working on a common normative uh, uh, agenda. Now, you know, development economists and development agencies, they're often not convinced just by normative arguments that it's the right thing to do. But the reason you see more of an embrace of this in recent years is because the lessons that have been learned from the ground are this actually means more effective, more sustainable development. It, when, you are, when you have participatory processes where there is ownership by those who are supposed to benefit from it, when you unleash the potential of groups that have been previously locked out from developing the society, whether they are women or particular minorities or disabled persons or older persons, um, that you actually have better uh, development um, uh, results. And so these kind of instrumental arguments in the end are as influential, maybe even more so with some audiences, than the normative arguments about mm. this being uh, the right thing uh, to do. I, I don't want to give you a whole thesis on this. I'm going to save some of this for the um, for the discussion. But I, I want to challenge what is w one of the, you know, there are political challenges. And these you'll see down the street in the GA all the time. Mm -hmm. Let's keep development and human rights separate. Mm -hmm. you know, human rights is your issue. Development is our issue. Uh, let's keep these things uh, separate. That political challenge is as real now as it was when the, you know, uh, uh, when the charter was drafted. More so, I would say. Um, there are technical challenges on how to do the work on the ground in ways that are effective. Ask any indigenous community that's been subjected to development and you'll find out that if you don't answer those technical questions in ways that are sensible, you can do a heck of a lot of harm uh, to people's human rights, uh, individual and, uh, and collective. But one of the big challenges that you are normally confronted with is the so-called financial challenge. 
this is a moment of financial crisis. This is a time for austerity. This is not a time for you know investing in processes. Um, uh, we really have to sort of tighten the belts now. And you know, I, I am all for fiscal responsibility. I believe in fiscal responsibility, personal uh, and national. But this argument is a lie. It's a lie. And the reason I know it's a lie is because it's simply not the case that the money is not there. The issue is an issue of political priorities and therefore of political mobilization. What international institutions and national governments decide to spend their money on uh, is a political choice. It's about setting priorities. And, and it has not been the case. You know, last year, global military spending was $1.75 trillion. $1.75 trillion in 2012 was spent on military. Uh, and you know, with, a, with enormous growth in many regions, uh, in the Middle East, in Asia, in Africa, in China, uh, enormous growth in, in military expenditures. Uh, so there's money there. The second thing that we know is that the average CEO pay, corporate compensation, has even through and beyond the um, crisis. financial crisis, has continued to go up and up and, and up. And so last year, the, the average CEO pay of the largest corporations was $12.9 million. One guy, usually, $12.9 million in pay uh, uh, for, for corporate compensation, even in a time of austerity and financial crisis. That's 380 times the average pay of an American worker, let alone uh, you know, a worker who's making $38 a day uh, mm. in Rana Plaza in Bangladesh when the walls come tumbling down and crush workers uh, to, to, to death. So there's money. Uh, there's money there. I, w one other example I think that the Millennium Project came up with, which is so compelling, was that in the whole modern period since the Second World War of aid, of foreign aid, right, for development and humanitarian affairs and everything else, you're, you're talking about um, an amount of $2 trillion. So $2 trillion in 55 plus years uh, for, for foreign aid, all of it. In one year, after the global financial crisis, they mobilized, take a deep breath, $18 trillion to bail out the banks. Mm. Right? So, so $2, two trillion in 55 years for aid, $18 trillion in one year to bail out the banks. So do you believe me when I say that the, the, the claim that there is no money for this is a lie? It's a question of politics. It's a question of political will. It's a question of setting priorities where human rights is the first priority. And yes, other national priorities uh, can follow. And I, this is the job, I think, of civil society, is pressing to make sure that those priorities are the right, uh, are the right priorities. And this is before you even get to th issues like corruption, siphoning off development in human rights resources, or even inefficient governance um, uh, doing this as well. So, and, and even if the financial challenges uh, have some real teeth, I think the one thing that you know, we need to think about here is we have to be very careful about Trumps when it comes to human rights. Uh, one after another, we've heard that security, borders, markets, and now austerity as Trumps for human rights. Mm. Yes, we believe in human rights, but at this moment in history, you know, the terrorists are coming to get us, so we have to focus on security, and so your rights go out the window. Or at this moment in history, you know, uh, you know the, the migrants are invading us, so we better, you know, beef up the borders, and this trumps uh, human rights all of a sudden. Mm. Or at this moment in history, uh, you know, we need to feed the markets. Or at this moment in history, austerity is the responsible thing to do. Now, there are two problems with that argument that I think we can talk about. Mm -hmm. One is that governments have an obligation for the progressive realization of economic and social rights. They can't just at will cut back on them by using the magic word of austerity. There is a very serious burden of proof that shifts to governments under international human rights law, uh, and that has a number of factors that we can talk about. I'm happy to lay out the framework for you in, uh, in, in our discussion. Uh, of that. Um, so, so that's not a get out of jail free card mm. that you suddenly declare as governments has, uh, have used it uh, all, all too often. Uh, again, question of, of political priority. The other problem with that, of course, is with all of those Trumps, is that's a very slippery slope. And we've seen by the proliferation of these, yes, human rights, but elements like archaic notions of national security. Personal security, human security, we're all for it. but. 
you know, if you can define security in such a way that includes summary executions, torture, arbitrary arrest and detention, that ain't security from, <laughs> from, from our perspective. Uh, and so we have to be really careful about those, those trumps. I feel like I've spoken too much. Um, so I'm going to stop. Uh, if that's okay, so that we can open this up for a dialogue and then we can get some other points in there as well. I'm very happy also that Nuhum Sangare, who manages the portfolio in our New York office on development and economic and social uh, affairs, is here. He can also be engaged in the conversation. May I stop? Thank you, Mr. Mokaiva. Uh, there was a lot of food for thought and uh, a lot of issues you presented are seemingly in intractable for, for, for me. Uh, so we were originally planning to have a second speaker, Mr. McDarrell, but due to a personal emergency, you couldn't join us. I'm not sure if Mr. Sangare wants to add a few words uh, to the discussion before we open it up. Uh, uh, yes, we have very few because he violated my right to say something. He said it all. <laughs> <laughs> violated you. Um, uh, already, but uh, if I have something very uh, brief to add, um, I would look into uh, what uh, member states are, the dynamics, uh, among uh, uh, member states. Uh, Greg mentioned it uh, uh, somehow. Uh, I think we can understand the political sensitivity of some, some, some issues at some point, uh, because the uh, UN system uh, has its own uh, history, so we Maybe put it closer, yeah. But when it comes to uh, Really denying what is what is evident uh, from uh, uh, perhaps the distortions of my my legal background, I, I, I would see here uh, something we call uh, bad faith, uh, because it's evident today that uh, the UN system uh, was established for the people. Uh, this same stand is still valid uh, if we re revisit the Charter of the United uh, uh, Nations Organization. But also looking at what is happening around. Uh, recently, we have seen uh, people uh, uh, in upraisings for uh, the cost of living they could not afford anymore. We have seen uh, the, 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 the Arab world, uh, uh, people uh, vindicating in the streets. Uh, we have seen in uh, 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 New York here the uh, World Street Occupy uh, movement. Uh, we have seen in Europe uh, so many countries. So. It's not a matter of uh, uh, one part of the, the world against another, uh, as this can be uh, the way uh, for some to try to explain uh, the positions in the intergovernmental uh, discussions. Uh, but today we have to open our, our, our eyes and ears and see what's happening around and uh, 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 take the opportunity we are offered today to rethink a new system and rebalance uh, uh, the whole development uh, uh, agenda. Uh, this is happening now uh, through uh, the post-2015 uh, discussion. <coughs> it's happening uh, uh, through the Open Working Group on uh, Sustainable uh, uh, Development uh, uh, Issues. Uh, we have to uh, try to accompany that process, uh, uh, making sure our, 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 our government uh, will uh, pay the tribute uh, we all owe to the people who have been uh, voicing uh, from uh, all regions of the world mm. through the UNDG uh, consultations asking for, 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 for the rights. Um, I can understand those, uh, at least those who uh, sometimes are questioning uh, about the how, uh, how human rights can be uh, relevant and uh, how it can inform uh, what is being done. And uh, uh, we have just uh, uh, presented uh, two uh, uh, interesting uh, uh, publications, uh, one done jointly uh, with uh, the Center for Economic and, uh, and, and, and Social Rights, uh, one touching on uh, indicators, how uh, the human rights framework can be used to frame goals, uh, targets, and, uh, and, 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 and indicators, uh, whether we uh, are speaking of uh, sustainable development goals, uh, but more broadly, the post-2015 uh, agenda. Uh, he did uh, 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 work also uh, on uh, uh, accountability, uh, what types of uh, accountability mechanisms we can put in place uh, from the local to uh, uh, regional and international mm -hmm. level. Uh, I will encourage you to read uh, uh, these uh, contributions uh, we are bringing on the, on the table uh, to answer uh, uh, 
to the questions uh, as to the how uh, human rights can uh, uh, really bring something useful uh, in, the, in, the, in the current discussions. So that's what I can add. Thank you, Mr. Sankari. So, friends, uh, this is really a, a, in, an informal meeting, so I open it up to the floor for any questions for the speakers. There's a wireless microphone here, and my colleague will help pass this around the room. So. Am I your colleague? <laughs> So I think a little bit of a roaming question. Um, uh, you know, sitting in the in the room today, and also having sat to other sessions as the as we try to come together on the goals for the sustain the sustainable development goals. One term is frequently heard, especially from civil society, of which I am a part of. That human rights have to be recognized and established, and and. Um, Part of the quandary I have, uh, as you know, listening to this is is the fact that that um, the realization of the mistakes that have been made in the past in terms of development um, give rise, you know, this time around, that sustainable development has to stand on three pillars, you know, the the ecology pillar, the economic pillar, and the social pillar. Another where it's society and the people in society have to be, um, you know, they also have to gain from this effort that we're putting together. Um, and, and I guess my question would be, um, is this a change? Do you think this is bringing about a change in the, um, what should I say, the, uh, the rift between development and human relations? Or is this just more of the same? The words are there, but um, uh, you know, there's nothing really behind it. You know, and, and then and then just just another thought. When we talk about human rights, we aren't talking about something explicitly tangible. Uh, you know, it, it's something that has to be a part of my 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 inner being. You might say, it, it has to be part of of what I do to um, evaluate things. Mm -hmm. It has to be something that I have really, what do I want to say, embedded into myself. Um, and you know, I you know, and I agree that there is just incredible human rights violations all over the place. I mean, you know, you know but Guantanamo is certainly one that um, you know just just can't be reconciled by anyone who even knows what the words human rights mean. Um, so, so I, well, anyway, I don't know what I've added or subtracted, but anyway, I, I would just appreciate, you know, some kind of um, response to any of that wandering of my mind. Thank you. Could I request you to identify yourself, please? I, I'm uh, Sister Kathleen Reese. I'm part of the Unanima NGO. Thank you. Perhaps we could take a couple more questions before coming back to the speakers, if, if that's okay. So Shannon and then uh, Sophia. Hi, I'm really glad that the Office of the High Commissioner is involved in, in this post 2015 discussion in such a deep and meaningful way, and I hope that we can together have some impact on the discussions. I spent the day actually reading um, the Sustainable Development Solutions Network report, mm -hmm. and um, for me, I'm Shannon Korsky with the International Women's Health Coalition as a women's rights activist and, and a human rights and sexual reproductive rights activist. So I read that report with a huge amount of alarm and trepidation about some of the approaches that were being put forward. So one of the areas that they propose is gender equality, social inclusion, and human rights, which is all very good and, and well. But they've siloed it into one goal, and they haven't taken a rights-based approach in any of their other recommendations. And in fact, a number of their other recommendations are incredibly regressive and incredibly harmful. Mm. So for example, under the goal of sus achieving sustainable development, they propose a um, fer total fertility rate reduction target, uh, which takes us back 20 years pre-1994, um, the conference on mm. interna the International Conference on Population and Development, where we thought that we had put these kinds of approaches to development to bed. Um, so there's a, you start seeing the rhetoric um, get picked up by some of these development actors, but 
it's clear that at the end of the day, it's not something that they're integrating into the, the real um, work that they're doing. They think that if they can mention the words, that that's enough, and that's clearly not enough. So there's a lot of work that we need to do to, ed to educate them. So I wanted to see if perhaps you were seeing something different in, in um, your discussions with member states and, and other governments, and whether there is a real commitment to taking a rights-based approach throughout this um, agenda. Thank you. One quick question from Sophia, and then we'll come back to the speakers. No, no, at the end. Thank you. Uh, my name is Sofia Garcia, and I am the Advocacy Advisor on Goals 2015 for SOS Children's Villages. Um, I have a lot of comments, I'll keep it brief. Uh, following a little bit on, on Shannon's comments also. Um, I think I thank you very much, Baha'i, for organizing these kind of talks that I wish would have happened much before we started thinking of goals, right? I think um, since since I've been working on the post-2015 agenda, I always say and, and try to keep in mind that we have one chance every 20 or 30 years to redefine development. And being in May, I think this chance is decreasing to rethink deeply what development means. Um, but still, we are having the dialogue, so it's very, very fine. And I think uh, this uh, separation between human rights and development, or how the development agenda has to integrate or be based on, or different approaches to human rights is a necessary conversation because what I see is happening uh, is that there is a redefinition of the human rights through the development agenda. And Shannon said, just including human rights, you know, as a word, all through the text, does not help. It has to be an interpretation of the agenda through the lens of human rights. And, and there is two points that are especially, I think are especially important. And one is this making very clear who is the duty bearer and who is the right holder, right? And in that sense, my question is, um, uh, what is your opinion on, there has been a lot of talk around the high level panels on eminent persons on post 2015 around the global partnerships. And uh, I, I personally, and uh, excuse myself, don't fully understand why they mean by that. I've read all possible, but it's still kind of in the air, but I see um, how do we do those global partnerships and how do we bring the, 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 for example, private sector, but not only in, without making sure or, or making sure that, that the real duty bearer is in the end the government um, and the right holders are the people. Uh, and then the second redefinition that I see is happening is on the very concepts of, for example, education and health and, or employment. Uh, for example, in the, in the sense of education, education is, and that's the message of, of an organization working with vulnerable children and disadvantaged children, education is a right. Education is not an instrument to create workers, it's a right and it's a, a way to empower people and create citizens, right? And by putting human rights as a part of development and not the other way around, we are allowing, and I, that's my second question, how can we uh, together push for a conceptualization, for the proper conceptualization of the goals? Uh, there will be a goal on education, but we need to ensure that education and health are perceived as rights and not, and not instruments. And then my third question, and that's a lot of questions, I'm sorry, but um, how can we integrate, there is a lot of talk around the universality of the framework and like universal goals with uh, targets and uh, national targets and so on. How can we integrate the common but differentiated responsibilities principle and how can we integrate the progressive realization principle and concept into the achievement? Okay, thank you. Mr. Mokaiba, Mr. Sangare. Goodness. Hmm. Um, yeah, see, these are all skilled speakers because they've all made important contributions and then in the end frame them as questions. And so I, I, I will just endorse <laughs> what is implied in each one of those uh, questions. Um, and I think, you know, there's a, there's a strain that runs through all, all three of them. And it, it's somewhere in here. You know, there are multiple layers to this process of the post-2015 agenda, which you're right, is now, this is the moment again to try to redefine development in a way that is consistent with human rights. Not just in a way that does no harm 
to people's human rights, but is actually designed to advance people's human rights as a principal uh, purpose of that agenda. But you know, here's here's the thing. You know, there are there's action taking place at the level of the UN system. There's political negotiation going on in the Open Working Group. There is a, a layer of consultation going on in the high-level panel, which is not an expert panel. It's also a quasi-political body because most of the members of the high-level panel are sitting politicians who are not going to go far away from their government uh, uh, positions, obviously. And there's a, there's a layer in there. There's the UN system, the UN Secretary General's task, task team on, on post-2015. You mentioned the Sustainable Development Solutions Network, headed by Professor Jeffrey Sachs, with lots of other academics um, uh, participating and others. In every one of those entities, this battle for the soul of development is mm. going on. And the kinds of things that we've been talking about today are powerfully opposed by powerful constituencies who don't want to see this kind of definitional process taking place for lots of reasons. Some of them because they're very invested personally in the MDGs. Some of them because they uh, don't want to compromise their understanding of government sovereignty, government power. Mm -hmm. uh, some of them because they, they are associated with a particular track one, one way or another. But it's a struggle in every one of those places. And they will do what they can get away with. I mean, that's, that's my definition of politics. They mm -hmm. will do what they can get away with. So. If there is a, a global mobilization that makes it politically impossible to ignore the serious integration of human rights, not just what the MDGs did, which was you have human rights mentioned in the preamble, but when you get down to the goals, uh, it's something altogether different. Not just mentioning human rights you know, here and there, but actually infusing it into the way that you structure the agenda. Um, that will depend upon how much of a mobilization there is that makes it politically uncomfortable for the delegations, in the end it's the member states who will decide, to, to do the right thing. And right now, I have to say, I'm reasonably optimistic. I can say that we certainly have come very far from where, where, where we were in 2000. We just had another uh, event in the UN, and we talk, people always talk about the, you know, the, the five or six men in a dark room in the basement of the UN drafting the MDGs. And one of the participants pointed out they were actually on the 38th floor, so we've changed it to talk about the five or six guys in the attic drafting the, uh, the, the MDGs. But basically, it was not a participatory process. And in addition to not being participatory, they built up walls intentionally to keep out anything that would expand the agenda beyond what they were trying to define. So at the time, they tried very hard not to have any gender considerations reflected in the framework at all. And because there was a bit of pushback, you can find things like a focus on maternal mortality and some, some other uh, elements in there. But on human rights, they said, Human rights are some vague, amorphous concept. They can't be measured, and they don't belong in a concrete, real development framework. Well, first of all, that's not true. We do have ways to measure human rights. Indeed, there are detailed indicator sets that have been developed for each one of the rights that are contained in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. The, the content of the international human rights framework on things like the right to health, the right to education, the right uh, to adequate housing, the right to a fair trial, are more well-defined than they are in any development framework uh, I, mm -hmm. I've ever seen. It's just a question of how serious we are in holding people accountable for reaching those levels. We have the notion of minimum core obligations which has been defined by the Committee on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights around economic and social rights, so that you can't get away by saying, okay, progressive realization, our treaty obligation, means you know, little by little we'll get there, and we don't have any immediate obligations. As a matter of law, that's just not true, and the committee has made that clear to states' parties, that they have immediate obligations under the covenant. Uh, that include the obligation not to discriminate, the obligation to take steps toward uh, full realization, the obligation to implement policies and set up mechanisms and set benchmarks and to measure, to report publicly on the progress that you're making, and the obligation of minimum core obligations, those necessities of health and housing and social security that are necessary to, to you know, for basic uh, standards of life, let's say. So. So the, the, they wielded what we called then the technocratic veto. Human rights, very important, but technically not feasible, so we're, we're not going to include it here. I think it's much harder for them to do it now for a couple of reasons. One is that the technical feasibility is much more codified now. As mm -hmm. I said, there are indicators, there are databases of practices, there are all of these examples. And the other is politically it's become very, it's become impossible. I mean, they, tr they have tried very hard to keep this out of the debate. 
Real plus 20, which was the foundation document for this process now, the zero draft outcome document was completely devoid of human rights considerations. Mm -hmm. But when the document was finally adopted, for all of the disappointments that we may find in the Real Plus 20 outcome, it was permeated by concrete human rights language, specific rights like the right to health, the right to education, the right to food, water, and sanitation, right to uh, decent work. Uh, sorry? Housing. <laughs> Housing, yeah. You know, a whole range of specific uh, human rights included in there. But in addition, a requirement that sustainable development needs to be built around international law and international human rights obligations that they're, they're contained in there. So there's, there's concrete stuff in Rio Plus 20 that's there not because the majority of delegations wanted it there, but because a battle was fought and in the end was won mm -hmm. to go from nothing in the zero draft outcome to significant progress in, uh, in not perfect because it's an intergovernmental process and document, but significant progress in integrating it. And, th and again, there's the politics, you know. They'll do what they can get away with is, is the, uh, the issue that shows uh, up again and again and again. You know, when, when the MDGs were adopted, human rights-based approaches were already the norm in lots of development, uh, amongst lots of development actors. They had been defined, they had, they had been tried, they had been integrated as a matter of policy in most of the work of most development agencies in one way or another. The fact that they weren't reflected in the MDGs just meant that they had no power mm. in those places where they were being deliberated. Opening up the post-2015 process to a more participatory process has provided an opportunity to get in there and make it much more difficult for them mm. to adopt a framework that doesn't pay, pay attention to human rights um, considerations. The rift, as you described it, is still there. There are still a lot of old talking points among delegations mm -hmm. uh, that want to keep human rights and development separate. It's not always helped, by the way, by delegations that purport to be supporting the human rights agenda because often what they're talking about is the same kind of sins that those rejected are talking about. So they want to talk about a narrow set of civil and political rights but not about economic and social rights, for example. They want to focus on the accountability of countries of the South but not about their own mm -hmm. accountability. Mm -hmm. uh, they want to, um, uh, to not focus on inequalities, uh, for, for example. Uh, 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 they want to focus on conditionalities, which mm. we think are unhelpful in uh, building of development frameworks. So they, they don't help it either. But the rift is still there, and it's as clear as it was then. The thing is that the minute you leave the General Assembly Hall and you get into the countries, you find that rift falls apart very quickly. That developing countries, for example, those people who have to do the work on the ground, governmental and non-governmental, are reaching out for international cooperation and support in all of these development sectors, the judiciary, personal security, institutions of political participation, uh, rights-based approaches to, to economic and social issues, uh, addressing problems of inequalities. So, um, so, you know, the politics, at least on the surface, have not changed a lot in terms of the players who have voting rights, but the UN has changed. You know, it's not just up to the foreign ministries anymore. Mm -hmm. We see you walk into the building this week and you'll see that we now have a forum for indigenous persons to actually be actively engaged in debates in the UN that affect their, uh, their lives. The same is true of non-governmental organizations to a level that was not true before. Independent national human rights institutions, uh, parliamentarians who sometimes play a positive role and sometimes play a negative role in, uh, in, in human rights, but the tent is getting larger and that's mm -hmm. making it harder and harder for representatives of foreign ministries to maintain the narrow agenda that they, they once had. I mean, you, you talked about the three pillars of sustainable development. I would argue that, that after Rio Plus 20, there are now four pillars. And that fourth pillar precisely is, uh, is the human rights element. Uh, so much has it been integrated in that document that it's made it impossible for them to, uh, to, to, to ignore it. Uh, I, the last thing I'll just say is that the private sector, somebody raised the issue of the private sector, and that's you know, what we've been saying is the accountability framework needs to encompass them. There's a lot of talk about the private sector in the post-2015 agenda, but most of that talk is about creating space for the private sector to invest. And what we're saying is what we need, in addition to that at least, is a focus on the accountability of the private sector for their impact on human rights. And we have a framework for it. We have the UN's guiding principles on business and human rights adopted in the Human Rights Council uh, unanimously with no uh, negative votes, uh, which, which establishes that framework, which, yes, is about the responsibility of businesses, private sector actors, to respect human rights. But it also includes, specifically as the second principle, the obligation of governments to protect people from harm hmm. by corporations, 
by regulating, regulation is not a bad word in human rights terms, we call it the rule of law, it's supposed to be a good thing, by regulating against mm -hmm. business harms. And then the third piece of that framework, which is the availability of redress and mm -hmm. remedy for people whose rights have been negatively affected by activities in the private sector, of the private sector. So that, in the accountability framework, you can't just bring business into the tent in a post-2015 agenda and say that you're making the world safe for corporations. It can't be about that. It has to be about the rights holders, the people, the individuals on the ground in making sure that the whole agenda, including what business does, is done in a way that, that is respectful and it actually advances uh, human rights. So it's a paradigm shift. Mm. It's a paradigm shift. It's not sprinkling the document with the word, the term human rights or putting it in the preamble. It's a paradigm shift and it's a fight and I think it's a winnable fight. It's mm. not a one fight and we're probably at 10% right now vis-a-vis uh, -vis the final agenda, but I believe that uh, it's a winnable fight. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, with everybody's permission, because we started late, so maybe we'll just extend one last round of uh, questions and comments from the speakers. So, and because I don't want to be known as the three men in the dark suit on the first floor that limited <laughs> participation. So. <laughs> so I have um, the lady in the maroon uh, and, and the lady in the, with the grey top, followed by the lady in blue and then uh, uh, Daniel. Commission on Sustainable Development. We had hoped to have citizen networks in every country in the world. We had hoped that we would take back what we had done in these chapters, which would inform action, thought, theory, and practice for the rest of our lives. We even had fantasies, I did, because I was a new young NGO representative. I didn't represent the International Social Science Council. But every 10 years, I would look at the chapter I helped write on health and we would see what was done and what was not done. Mm -hmm. Now that has not happened. Mm -hmm. We are drafting yet another agenda, mm -hmm. sometimes as if the conventions and the treaties and the human rights frame does not exist. Uh, Garfinkel, a sociology designer, once said there are always good reasons for bad methods. Yes. And I think that we need more analysis more intergenerational talk, more use of our history to begin to understand why we do this. Why every 10 years do we draw up another agenda that it doesn't get implemented? And then we do another one and another one. And some of us will live to see the next one and some of us won't. But the process has a certain repetitive quality. So I was curious as to if there were ways to effectively hear other voices kinds of experts, not only economists, uh, and uh, organize in a different way to look at the process that has led to where we are. And so we don't repeat a process in which maternal and infant health is not commonsensically accepted as the right of every woman, child, and man, uh, wherever they are, and that nobody should have to die while giving birth. Part of, uh, without the kind of technology that we can provide for the 21st century. So I was curious if you had any suggestions about how we could go about organizing in a different kind of way to address mm. some of the reasons why we are what we, where we are mm. and what can we do to avoid not being here in 20, 35, 20 years from now. Thank you. And uh, the lady with the black and gray top? Thank you. Um, I'm Eva Freeland with the International Women's Anthropology Conference. And uh, as first of all, I just want to say I'm very pleased to hear somebody call a spade a spade on the various issues that you've, you've gone through. Um, I think that's a, a real step forward, and um, I'm glad that the UN is uh, that has a few people Um, my question really has to do with the barriers to achieving um, 
not just the language, and I think the language is incredibly important, and that's most of what is going on right now, but uh, the realities that people uh, lift us on the ground, doing something about that, um, that isn't, again, as you said, something that is going to take um, 100 years at, at a minimum. Um, and I see the whole um, quantitative and counting approach as being very problematic um, because we are always coming to having to negotiate what is being counted, what are the indicators, and how are we going to measure when certain things are blatantly evident to anyone who has two eyes and two ears. So, um, you know, when I hear that Bangladesh, uh, where I've worked, um, is making progress and step out of the airport, or don't even have to step out of the airport. It's patently obvious that, uh, that things are going in the opposite direction of, of the way that they should be going. So the question really is, how do you, what do you see as, um, as the main barriers, the, the issues of power, obviously, and economic power in particular, um, but how do you see taking everything the next step beyond the language, beyond the words, which we're fighting for now. Thank you. And to the lady in blue over here. Thank you. Uh, first, I, I want to congratulate your sister, because I think that the 7 billion people in the world should feel like you, and then the change will come. Mm -hmm. That human right belongs to you, you own it, and it directs your life. And this is something that we all have to do. You know, we meet and we stay in meetings, we talk a lot. And uh, I love to meet this young man who was a good friend when he was in New York. He's still a good friend. But the idea is that Just we need to learn, but very few of us need to see to it that what we have learned, other people know too. And this is an absolute must. The other thing I want to congratulate, which is you call human rights a framework. Even though the other person spoke about approach, but human rights is a framework. It's not an approach. The minute it becomes an approach, it's a downward way. Now, uh, what I would like to, we have to rejuvenate the language of human rights. Mm -hmm. I just came from a meeting of Alliance of Civilization, where I'm trying to evolve them to work towards the 65th anniversary. And he said, many countries don't want even to, work, to hear the word human rights. So I think it is your responsibility, and I really call on you, to see how we give a new vision to human rights. Because still we think it is a violation, is you know, bending our, instead of seeing it as a part of our structure, oh, I have human rights, it's always about violation, violation. Not that they don't exist, but we have to move to that. I would like to make a suggestion to you, and you tell me how you think about it. Uh, what we have to do, I believe, is start a dialogue around the world of the meaning of human rights to people's daily lives and speak of human rights as a way of life. But maybe we could start with something that would sound a little too poetic. <laughs> something to create discussions around the world that it is, it's not capitalism, it's not socialism, neither is it patriarchy, it's human rights as a way of life. And these are really the main three things, you know, patriarchy, and you spoke of power. We always spoke to human rights learning that we give power to people. But the question is that what rules in the world is power, fear, and greed. There are three words that spell differently, but they mean the same. So the question is whether we can have people themselves define what is it to have power of human rights. So the suggestion is let's start a dialogue on, I'll repeat myself, forgive me, is it's not capitalism, neither is it socialism, Neither is it patriarchy, but it's human rights as a way of life. Thank you. And a final comment and question from Daniel. Uh, good afternoon. Sorry it's about their five. We'll try not to keep people too long. <coughs> so I have a question first, and that's uh, for Mr. Mokaibo. I, I thank you very much for the presentation. I, I really want to echo my colleague who said you, you seem to speak, to call a spade a spade. I'm curious, uh, what has been the kind of receptivity if any, that you've gotten from member states, if you share 
perspectives with them. Uh, because that would be useful for us to know as we try and participate mm -hmm. going forward as mm -hmm. well. Um, another comment responding to my colleague over here is that I think one of the things we try to do at this office, uh, I'm, I work at this office, is, is offer a space where people can contribute uh, in a constructive way without attachment to their agency or their nation or what have you. And hopefully that kind of um, cultural shift can have a positive effect so that we spend less time coming up with big goals and more time actually finding truth. Uh, and that, that gets me to my third point, sort of, is that you know we all seem to see that humanity is sick at the moment, and, and we're trying to use development as a cure. And then you look at what we measure in terms of the MDGs or the SDGs or, or whatever DGs are coming out. And my question to myself is whether or not what we measure is the disease or the symptom. It's clear that it's the symptom. So when you have a fever, if you just treat the high temperature, you don't cure the virus. And so what, I'm, what I, I question, and I would encourage all of us to think about, I don't have an answer. Is, is what is, how do we treat the actual disease that is afflicting humanity, rather than continuing to name all the symptoms? And, and if we can hone in on that, personally, I think human rights is much closer than the MDGs, for example, to, to curing that disease. But I think that that question is something that I, I, I try to critically reflect on uh, as I, I work here. Uh, so. Thank you. Thank you. So responses from Mr. Mokaiba and Mr. Sangare? Yeah, well. <laughs> <laughs> Look, I mean, I'll, I'll work backwards. I think absolutely um, the problem with the kind of Band-Aid approach to continue your medical metaphor is it doesn't get to the root causes of, uh, uh, of all of this. And unfortunately, if you sort of look at those moments in history where you had very significant change, it was always on the heels of a major catastrophe yeah. where yeah. it just was ridiculous to put a Band-Aid on, uh, yeah. um, on, on what was a much gorier uh, condition. Um, so I don't. I just don't know. Um, even looking at the UN, you know, short of another major catastrophe, what will wake people up? Yeah. We have been complaining now uh, since 2008 that what governments have done in response to the global financial crisis was not even band aids. It was a lot of business as usual, mm. um, and uh, none of the sort of root causes of the crisis have really been addressed at the international level or at, at the national. Uh, level because of a lack of political will to do so because of the distortions of power that those who benefited from the old system still have that power still have that wealth that relates to that power and still uh, have at their service uh, those who are in a position to, to to make policy to make regulations and and so on so so clearly it's a kind of you know shooting yourself in the foot you don't fix what caused it and you set the stage for a greater uh, catastrophe ultimately. So I, I, all I can say is you're right that the challenge is a challenge of root causes if they're not addressed in the kinds of social and legal and other ways that um, that they need to be addressed meaningfully then maybe we'll get that crisis, that that global catastrophe again that will force meaningful change. I hope it doesn't have to, uh, it doesn't to have that. to come to that, yeah. But um, member states reactions, um, I mean and this this actually, so you asked you know, how are member states reacting to these kind of prescriptions and uh, I, First of all, you know, we've, we're just finishing a round of uh, bilaterals with key delegations um, that we've been doing for the last three days. And uh, overall, very positive in the idea that the framework should reflect human rights, that it should include governance issues as well as economic and social issues, that it needs to address inequalities, that it needs to address the, the global structures, the international reform needs that, mm -hmm. uh, that exist and so on. Um, but those are sort of general principles that it's become, as I said, impossible to, to so dismiss. Know, yeah. um, and the how that will be negotiated in the conference rooms, you know, at the last minute uh, of, of the General Assembly, that's still to be determined, and I expect the same kind of resistance that we, we've mm -hmm. always had on those, <coughs> those issues. But the problem really, uh, this goes to the question of you know, what are the real barriers uh, as well. You know, there, so there, there was a compact called the Universal Declaration of Human Rights in 1948, and it said that um, it, it laid out civil, political, economic, social, and cultural rights on par. 
and it said, you know, run your society the way you want to run your society. Have the economic system that you want to have. Mm -hmm. Have your whatever kind of president or king or whatever the hell it is that you want to put at the top of your state as, a, as an entity. Um, but here's the ground rules. Here's the bottom line. All human beings without discrimination are entitled to this set of rights. Uh, and, you know, in another article of the Declaration, everyone is entitled to a social and international order in which these rights yes. can be realized. And what's happened since that compact was put into words, if it was ever really agreed amongst uh, uh, different member states, is that this smorgasbord approach has been adopted of human rights. Hmm. So on any given day in our office, we are approached by delegations of member states who are praising what we're doing on one set of rights or the other set of rights, or what we're saying about one country about the other country, and damning us for what we're mm. saying about the other set of rights and the other country. Mm. In other words, you know, human rights should be focused on what our enemies are doing and not on what we and our friends are doing <laughs> geographically. <laughs> and depending on which geographic group they're, they're represented in, you should spend more time on civil and political rights and less time on economic and social rights. Or the other side says more time on economic and social rights, <laughs> less on civil. Stop talking so much about racism and migration. Focus more on freedom of expression, LGBT rights. The other side says stop talking about LGBT and focus more on, uh, you know, whatever. Whatever, yeah. You know. So, so the minute you turn it into, uh, I'm going to get off your medical metaphor and get on a food metaphor now. It's, it's getting close to dinner. Uh, you know, the minute you get out of this well-balanced diet that was designed by the Universal Declaration of this whole set of interdependent human rights, and you start saying, "I'll have some of this, but not some of that," the whole thing falls apart. Yeah. And that's that's a huge barrier uh, right now. You know. It's, it, it doesn't mean that some countries of the North are more committed to civil and political rights. Let's face it, there's no such thing as an altruistic government. Mm -hmm. Governments <coughs> are concentrations of power that exist for certain functions. We think what makes government legitimate is the degree to which they deliver. Here's my slogan again. They deliver on freedom from fear and freedom from want for everybody without discrimination. That's the principal job of governance. Everything else is frosting, you know. Mm -hmm. um, uh, that's where legitimacy com comes from, as we understand it from the Charter and from the Human Rights Instruments and the Universal um, uh, Declaration. Um, but that's not, that's not the way they engage on these issues. They want very much to be able to pick and to choose and to select. And they will do it to the extent that they can get away with it. Now, again, you know, I'm still hopeful. The reason I'm hopeful is because you know, the question about new ways to address the politics and the power imbalances, there, there are some. And I think, you know, sunlight is an amazingly powerful force. I've been working in the UN uh, as a staff member for 22 years. And before that, I was involved as, a, as an NGO. And I've seen just in that very short amount of time uh, enormous changes in who's in the tent. Hmm. Um, and, and that is changing things. You know, the fact that we have now sessions that are webcast, you know, hmm. live so others can hear not what the other countries are saying, but what their representative. I'm not. I have always been convinced that if most people knew what their representative was saying in the UN, they'd be shocked and disappointed hmm. uh, on human rights questions. You know, um, I, I can tell you, working in the UN Human Rights Program for many years, that governments spend much more energy on trying to stop us from doing things than they do from trying to get us to do more in terms of protection of uh, of human rights. So shining that light broader participation, expanding civil society engagement, other groups like indigenous peoples, women's mm -hmm. organizations, uh, uh, and so on. The use of social media is transforming things. We tweet live. Most delegates don't know what it means to tweet, but we tweet live. Uh, we use YouTube. Uh, uh, Facebook is now a part of the UN um, uh, reality. Um, we use it not just in getting the message out and exposing what's happening in the UN, but they're, they're now used as tools, for example, for human rights protection. Uh, increasingly. That's something new. Um, that's something that is helping to make a difference because it enhances participation. It makes it harder for them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it makes it harder for them not to do uh, the right thing the way that they, they need to do the right thing. And I think the last thing that makes me, and that needs to be expanded, I, mean, I think that's the challenge. The challenge is to get as many other forces into the tent to water down the concentrations of power that exist now. The extreme example of the, you know, the, the bad case of that is the Security Council. Security Council mm -hmm. is a World War II relic. Uh, you know, for all of the good reforms we had, there was a proposal in the 2005 summit that Security Council members should uh, voluntarily abstain from the use of the veto 
-hmm. when we certify through the SG or the High Commission or whatever that there are war crimes, crimes against humanity, ethnic cleansing or genocide. Just at that threshold, those serious crimes, not asking them to give up their veto, but the P5 should abstain from the use of the veto only in those circumstances. That proposal lasted all of 12 seconds mm -hmm. before you know, the permanent members of the Security Council made it evaporate into, uh, into thin air. There's a lot of reform that remains to be done but bringing additional sets of eyes and additional voices into the UN tent, I think, are, are, are the best way to um, are the best way to do that. And I'm I'm hopeful because I see that change actually taking place in very significant ways. And I'm hopeful also because this I mentioned this thing before the alchemy of human rights. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's no way you should enter into a room with a bunch of delegations who are there, all of them, to say no on something. I mean, they're there mostly to say no, uh, and yet you come out of it with now 20 years later we're celebrating the Vienna Declaration and Program of Action it's 20 year anniversary next month in June the World Conference on Human Rights yeah. uh, where I challenge you to find anything in there that you don't celebrate um, it shouldn't happen but it does because of the alchemy of human rights and a part of that alchemy is that everybody comes in with a no but they come in with some yeses as well and the deal in the end is to agree on the yeses uh, and the other thing is that that tent includes voices from civil society. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, watch the way a delegation behaves in the open-ended uh, working group on the human rights of older persons when they're alone in their seat or when three rows behind them is a representative of a major civil society organization from their country that represents the rights of older persons. Mm. The power of civil society, the power of participation, I think, is what, is what gives us a lot of hope that the power imbalance could be changed, and that this institution, which has an excellent charter, uh, you know, can actually be true to its charter and can help to make a difference in, in those three pillars of human rights, uh, development, and, and peace and security. So I'm hopeful. Are you hopeful? Uh, I'm hopeful, and uh, I will uh, just repeat uh, what you said. Uh, let's uh, let's uh, stay mobilized and engaged to make it uh, hard and uh, even difficult or at the extreme level impossible for them to ignore hmm. uh, what is really re relevant for us and uh, for all the people uh, who are watching the game. We don't need to wait for uh, another catastrophe. Um, but if we uh, uh, just listen to them, we uh, don't trust in... Uh, our, our, our powers to change uh, the situation, um, perhaps another catastrophe will happen. Mm -hmm. Because um, also, uh, which happened in the past, uh, we know how they, 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 they happened. So let's uh, 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 trust that uh, uh, the, the, the advantage they, they, they have is only a functional advantage, but the real legitimacy is with us mm -hmm. and all the people around the world. And this can make a difference if continue pushing. Absolutely. Thank you. So on behalf of all the NGO colleagues here, really thank you very much to the office and to both of you for spending the time with us and for providing a very well-balanced diet for this afternoon. <laughs> uh, thank you very much. Thank you.